Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, okay. All right, there's a request, a prayer request from uh, Enoch who is asking for prayer because of a total blackout now. So we'll, we'll pray for him as well. Nigerian, okay. Uh, all right, in Nigeria. All right, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us, Lord, to spend in your word. We pray by your spirit that you will enlighten our hearts, O God. And Father, we are grateful for your word, Lord, that uh, strengthens us, that builds us up, Lord, and that helps us to, to walk in that newness of life that Christ Jesus has died to give us. And Lord, we pray together for brother's success. We pray, Lord, for... Uh, uh, Lord, your intervention in these circumstances, Lord, uh, that uh, Father God, uh, things will be resolved and uh, Lord, that uh, they, they will be able to resume uh, their activities as usual. And Father, uh, thank you that you are a prayer answering God. We surrender this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, let's get back to what we have been discussing so far. We completed uh, a large section of uh, chapter two, James chapter two. So let me quickly review a couple of things and then we will go to the uh, end of James chapter two and then do James chapter three today. Uh, so we saw in James chapter two that there was an instruction not to engage in partiality because uh, God has called us to honor everyone and we must not discriminate uh, among people and partiality or uh, favoritism is unfair and uh, it's an expression of prejudice. That's something we looked at uh, and we saw that uh, when we do such things, uh, we are judged. That scripture says we are judges with evil thoughts. So it's as if you know we are judging with evil standards, uh, which is not acceptable in the sight of God. Um, and uh, this could lead to problems can arise, you know, out of such judgment. Uh, and then we saw that uh, whether people are rich or whether they are poor, they are all the same in the sight of God. And just for for the people to understand, uh, James makes statements such as, you know, like uh, the rich aren't they the people who harm you? You know, he kind of puts it in that perspective. But the point that he's making is that uh, the poor, poor are also created by God. They're also chosen by God. They're also co-heirs of the covenant blessings that uh, Jesus died to give us. So there is that equality as far as the love of God, the blessings of God are concerned. So it's not to say that being rich is bad or being rich is evil. Uh, and, you know, once he clarified regarding this matter of uh, not showing partiality, he talks about extending mercy. And uh, he states that uh, extending mercy is, excuse me, what triumphs over judgment. And then we looked at a law. He talks about the law of uh, liberty. In the Old Testament, we know there were uh, the laws given by Moses. And even if one were to break a single law out of uh, all of them, they would still not be able to uh, uphold the law. And uh, and then he comes on to talking about the fact that uh, God has given us the law of liberty, and which is nothing but in the new covenant. Okay, so that's what we're referring to. He talks about something called as a royal law, um, and uh, he talks about the law of liberty, which has to do with the kind of love, grace, and freedom that the cross has brought for us. And then we saw this description about having faith and works faith and works are two sides of the same coin uh, he asks questions like okay if i have faith is that good enough and you know if you say you have works is it good enough and then he says no we need both we need both of them and when we say we have faith we have to put actions to our faith so 
uh, that's where we were at and we said we saw how he makes the statement that if we say that we only believe but there are no actions corresponding to our faith it's like uh, the demons also believe uh, but then we don't we don't account righteousness to demons they belong to the kingdom of darkness so just simply believing something doesn't uh, you know cut it for us we have to be believers who are doers of the word faith must be in action so the section here from uh, verse 20 to 26 this is something that we did not explain uh, we'll quickly read through it so i'm going to ask someone to read through it last time we read section by section so that you know we save time so can we just go ahead and uh, read through it please and then i will just summarize it and uh, share the details from the section james chapter 2 verse 20 to 26 james chapter 2 verses 20 26. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works of the works, faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amen. Thank you, Rosalie. A uh, very strong statement here. It begins with a question asking, isn't faith without works dead? And he concludes also, he says that as the body without spirit is dead, faith without works is dead. And then he brings in two examples here. One, that of our father of faith, Abraham. And another one, a very unique example of Rahab. And it's so unusual. He could have spoken about any other patriarch from uh, from the Old Testament times, but he picked Rahab. Now, why did he actually select these two people? We know regarding Abraham. You know, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was called as the friend of God. And he was a man justified by works, not by faith only. And we understand that you know he was a man uh, who believed God to the extent that one particular uh, uh, incident in his life, right? We saw in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, uh, verses 17 to 19, when he sacrificed his son Isaac, or he went to sacrifice, sorry, his son Isaac with the readiness of heart. The reason he could do it is he believed that even if his son were to die, God was able to raise him up. That really shows that his actions of taking his son Isaac for that sacrifice was fueled by the strong faith that he carried uh, with regard about God, that God is even the one who raises the dead. So there was faith and so there was action. Because he believed God is a God of resurrection, he went ahead and he was ready to sacrifice his son Isaac. So we see the uh, mingling together of faith and actions because he believed he did and uh, that is the example that James wants to point to and remind us when we say we have faith what is the corresponding action are we aligned are we doing things aligned to our belief uh, and we can apply this to all aspects of our life and you know reflect and see is faith accompanying my works. Now think about Rahab. Now, Rahab was a, a, a Gentile. She's not part of the covenant. Uh, but what God in her, did in her life is very unique. Uh, when the Israelites were, were occupying the, the promised land and uh, they came 
up to the walls of Jericho, there was this lady, not of a good reputation or anything, uh, but she helped the spies. And like, uh, I mean, this is like the backstory, but then when the people came to that place and the walls of Jericho actually came down, at that point, only Rahab and her family were protected. Was that the end of God's blessings on this person of faith? She is outside the covenant, but her actions were such that she demonstrated great faith in God. One is to safeguard the spies who came to the land. Secondly, you know, we see that she, she hung that uh, scarlet uh, uh, ribbon outside her, her house. And these were all acts of faith in God and uh, revealing that she trusted that God would protect her family even if danger came upon the entire city. And uh, her faith was so commendable that we see not only was her family protected in, in that, uh, 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 you know, that, that occurrence, but Rahab had a great destiny in God. We know that she uh, became one of those uh, in, the, in the lineage of uh, Jesus Christ, right? She's one of those uh, women who was outside of the Hebrews and uh, that was the blessing that came upon her. So Rahab is also a symbol of faith. She believed in God. She believed in the protection of God. Therefore, she did. So her faith accompanied works. And this is interesting at another level because Rahab is kind of the great grandmother of James. We began our learning of the book of James saying that James is a half brother of Jesus. So which means that uh, Joseph is his father and Joseph is the lineage, right? David's lineage. And we know that Rahab is a part of that and uh, so he's talking about his great 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 grandmother as well and he's talking about the faith that she carried uh, which was accompanied by her works so the point of this section is our faith comes to a place of completeness or our faith becomes effective when it is coupled with works so only when we say i believe i believe i believe uh, that is incomplete. And he's using the, the uh, statement that faith without works is dead. You know, very strong statement. But what he's saying is, look, it's incomplete. There's got to be spirit in the body. Then it's complete. So that completeness only comes when our actions accompany uh, our faith. So actions actually express the faith that we carry. And that is why it is so important. So that is the conclusion of chapter 2 here. And now we can uh, jump to chapter 3 of the book of James. So let's quickly go here to chapter 3. And it's uh, uh, about a very, very important thought, which is about our tongue. Okay, our tongue and uh, uh, how powerful this tongue can be. How about we read the entire passage and then I quickly, you know, run through and explain it for us. Uh, so two, two of us, I think, two should be fine. Eight, eight verses each could just pick it up and uh, read the entire passage and then I'll go ahead and explain. The untamable tongue. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter ju judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. 
even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things see how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind but no man can tame the tongue it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison amen Yes, go ahead, Jafika. James chapter 3, verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth, cursing, my brother, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape be? Grape wine fear beer fix. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly and spiritual demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, Jafina. Let's now look at the uh, passage in its entirety and uh, understand what James is discussing here. So he starts with a comment on um, a sign of maturity. What is an indicator of maturity? So he says something like, you know, firstly, he says, anyone who wants to be a teacher must first be a doer of the word and then be a teacher of the word. So that's the right order. We do first and then we teach. Because if we are teaching something that we do not do, uh, then that is hypocrisy. Isn't it? There's no integrity in that we do something else, but we teach uh, another standard. So he's saying, look, uh, those who are teachers must do what they uh, must teach what they do. And uh, he also says that uh, uh, there is going to be a stricter judgment. So that again is a reminder that, you know, we, we have to uh, uh, have integrity, right, in uh, who we are and what we teach. There's a parallel scripture, Matthew 5, 19, where uh, that's exactly what is brought, brought out. That scripture says, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So in a gist, for those of us who are called to teach the word, uh, we will be subject to a stricter judgment and uh, not only that we are called to higher standards uh, and god wants us to live by higher standards uh, and, and that's when you know we will be we will position ourselves in a place where we can uh, teach with authority because what we are doing is we are firstly practicing we are firstly applying uh, and then we are presenting the truth to the people. So that's something to note. Now, let's move on. He uh, In verse 2, there is a comment about, you know, uh, somebody who does not stumble in the word being a perfect man. What is a perfect man? Perfect, uh, when, when we go by the language in which this was written, uh, it, it is uh, mature. So perfect means mature. Perfect doesn't mean the way we understand it, right? Like fully, like completed and uh, nothing more needs to be improved in that person. But it means maturity. Someone who has gone to great levels of growth in their uh, spiritual walk with the Lord. So he says, the person who is mature, 
what is a correct sign of uh, such a person a sign would be that they are able to control their tongues okay so what they speak what is coming out of the mouth is under control now such a person such a person is who james is referring to is uh, someone who is not stumbling in word and is a perfect man and when one is able to control their tongue then uh, it is likely that they are able to control uh, or they are when we say control basically it's about uh, management you know managing what we have so we are able to manage other aspects of life uh, such as our passions such as our emotions um, such as the decisions that we make uh, our choices and uh, keep these things in check but all these other things can be managed if one is firstly able to manage speech or how what we speak if it is like uh, uh, a a response that makes sense but reactionary like we have no control and we we are just reacting reacting anything we want we are speaking that is not a sign of maturity so he talks about that and uh, he uh, reminds us about the right character mature character and fully developed character uh, that we need to have uh, which has this connection firstly with controlling or managing the speech or the words now let's continue to talk about the tongue so he's talking more about the tongue and he gives us examples of bits in horses mouths he gives us a uh, example of rudder in a ship he also uh, talks about how a little bit of fire right a kindles a forest fire Uh, a spark rather kindles a forest fire so when we consider a bit in a in a horse's mouth or a rudder or a spark of fire they seem very insignificant because they are small and uh, it feels like you know what is it that they can accomplish but the reality is these tiny little things uh, can decide the course uh whether the you know the horse is going east or west or north south determined by that bit in its mouth or a rudder same way right it directs a ship uh, and uh, a forest fire obviously uh, a, a careless spark of uh, fire can start off and destroy entire uh, forest we've we've seen right like how sometimes it takes a couple of months even to put down the fire even in our modern day uh, with the access to modern day technology so it's dangerous it's dangerous uh, and so he says in verse 5 the tongue is a little member of our body very similar to what we discussed just now the tongue is also very little but the way uh, these other uh, things have great power he says the tongue boasts great things and see how great a forest a little fire kindles so he's teaching us about the power of the tongue teaching us about the power of the words that we speak and uh, he also says that when one chooses to speak uh misaligned to the word of god you know what, what does that mean one's own thoughts or a worse still influenced by the by the uh, demonic world we may release words that are destructive that um are uh, bring all kinds of you know uh, evil consequences uh, which can break people's spirit and uh, which which do evil uh things in in people's lives and he is saying that in verse 6 he says the tongue is a fire okay the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell we just discussed about an evil tongue that speaks destructive words and notice at the end of that uh, verse it says and it is set on fire by hell so such a tongue 
uh, which is speaking iniquity, it's as if, you know, there's fire in hell, right? There's fire in hell. We know that. It's as if a flame from there has come and that is what has lit up that evil tongue. So he's speaking like that. He's saying, look, that flame has come from hell itself uh, to a destructive tongue that destroys people's spirits. Uh, and uh, that is something for us to be very careful about. Uh, and he also reminds us here, see, why is the tongue so dangerous? The course of our lives depends. He says this. He sets on fire the course of nature, the direction in which we are going to head head up in life depends on what we are speaking how we are speaking about ourselves about others we can keep destroying relationships right by speaking evil and bringing up uh, uh, so many things so what's happening it's affecting our relationships it's affecting our our uh, life day-to-day -day life in general and that is leading us somewhere that is creating a certain future for us uh, and so we are responsible and he says a sign of maturity is when one can manage the tongue and not allow these destructive words he also says that when one speaks these evil words not aligned to the word of god uh, it does another damage and he says it defiles the whole body it de defiles the whole body we can uh, take this up as you know defiling our body uh, and in, in a sense, we could even think that uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the way we've, we've uh, said that life and death is in the power of the tongue. So the blessings that are due us when we speak the word of God, those come, they minister to our spirit, our soul and body. But uh, in the case of an evil tongue, we are ministering, uh, you know, the lack of those blessings or destruction to our body. And that's a sad part. So we are, first of all, defiling our body. Secondly, the direction of our lives is going in a, in a, 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 to a place that is not good. So he says, then what should we do? What should we do? We've got to go towards maturity. And one of the things about maturity is being able to control the tongue. So he starts now speaking about taming the tongue. And he says, look, it's isn't it so interesting that man is able to tame wild beasts uh, and uh, reptiles, creatures of the sea. And we've all seen this. A lot of this happens. Sometimes people are taming lions and, you know, you have um, uh, big sea creatures, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, they they go do some tricks with uh, crocodiles and things like that. And you wonder, wow, you know, man is so powerful. He's able to tame these dangerous uh, and uh, sometimes wild animals. But you know what? When it comes to taming our own tongue, that's where many of us struggle. And man struggles. Mankind in general struggles. But he says that we need to tame the tongue. So what does taming the tongue mean? Keeping it under control and choosing what we want to speak. And he goes on to talk about how uh, the same tongue can speak good and evil. Right? The same tongue can bless their brothers and it can also curse their brothers. Now, uh, he says that same tongue that blesses God the Father curses men. Uh, and so... It's like a stream of water from which you get sweet drink, fresh water, and also bitter water. But how can that happen? How can that happen? Okay, we know that from a spring, we can only get one, a certain type of water. But if there's a mix-up happening, uh, uh, that that is not good. That's not good, and especially for us as believers. And so he says, look, let this not be the case where fresh water and salt water, or in other words, you know, good things and evil things are mixed up. And uh, that's what we are bringing forth from our tongues. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, now he is moving on and he's saying, look, why don't we apply wisdom? Earlier, when we looked at um, chapter one, he talked about 
asking god for wisdom right asking god for wisdom when we are in a difficult circumstance he said count it all joy brethren you know when you find yourself in um, all kinds of uh, uh, trials and then he went on in verse 5 and he said if anyone lacks wisdom let him ask god and god who gives uh, you know generously will give it to him so even now he starts to speak about wisdom because wisdom is connected even even to uh, speaking the right words okay and uh, uh, he talks about wisdom so he says who is wise and understanding among you let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom so he says um, one must have wisdom and the person who has wisdom what is the sign that they carry wisdom good conduct of their lives right and uh, good works that are done when we look at the good conduct we look at the good works then we know that oh okay you know this person is demonstrating wisdom uh, but if there are other seeds in the person's life so he is pointing out to things like bitter envy self seeking in the heart okay uh, then these things work against the truth of god's word so when one carries wisdom you know uh, maturity it will be seen through the good life but when one doesn't carry that and instead you know carries a uh, seeds of uh, envy and selfishness in their heart then their lives are against the truth of god's word and that even that begins to show and so he says look it's better to get wisdom and certainly he is also making a, a point with relate with relation to the tongue uh, we could say because how do we how do we tame the tongue we need god's wisdom before we speak you know before we are addressing uh, matters and uh, it it shouldn't be reactionary but it's got to be a response see even anger is a good thing because we see that jesus got angry when he saw unrighteousness uh, but it was not like you know uh, outbursts of anger because outbursts of anger rage all that comes under the um, fruit of the flesh right the acts of the flesh that we see and listed in galatians chapter 5 um, but a wise man may have righteous anger but even in those situations the words that we speak right very intentional even if we are bringing in correction or we are bringing in um uh you know some instruction it's got to come from the right heart and uh, speak it for um bringing about god's purposes in that situation and that's a sign of maturity that's a sign of wisdom and we need wisdom uh, even to speak the right words and it's a sign of maturity which we already established now since we're talking about wisdom he says uh, wisdom does not this wisdom does not descend from above but is earthly sensual demonic so he's talking about uh, uh, a wisdom that which causes fleshly aspects of us to thrive right we call it wisdom but then when we look at the conduct the behavior um, as he has enlisted envy self seeking all that comes through but the wisdom that is being presented now is a worldly wisdom right uh, and we can see that in the actions we can see that in the behavior we can see that in the results so he he's telling us earthly wisdom is connected to fleshly acts whereas godly wisdom is connected to godly actions um, and again he talks a little bit more here about you know envy and self seeking where there is envy and self seeking confusion and every evil thing is there every um, evil thing are there so <laughs> it's like a key for us to check whether there is envy in our hearts envy is um, jealousy when we are uh, we we begin to focus on others and compare start comparing ourselves uh, a, a, you know so, and we say that oh okay you know how come they are better how come they have more uh, and uh, it causes a, a sense of um, 
dislike for the other person. That is envy, right? Envy and self-seeking. It's a selfish attitude, selfish behavior. He's saying when we carry these things in our hearts, it will create a lot of confusion. So we must be careful never to allow these things to dwell in our hearts. Okay. Uh, so get rid of envy. Get rid of self-seeking. Now let's move on. Uh, he is talking about wisdom, isn't it? So he's, he just gave us a picture of what godly wisdom is not, what fleshly wisdom looks like. It will carry uh, fleshly things, right? And uh, uh, we must be careful not to allow them in our lives or in our hearts. But when we give place for godly wisdom, it will bring forth the fruit of righteousness in our lives so what exactly does godly wisdom do so we have verses 17 and 18 throwing light on that it says but the wisdom that is from above now notice there are features of that wisdom so godly wisdom has facets it has um, characteristics it has features what are these features we are going to look at them. Um, eight different ones are listed here. And uh, uh, we will discuss about them. Eight traits are listed here. So I'll read the scripture first. He says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. It is gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy so these are the traits and verse 18 he says excuse me now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace so let's look at all these traits first you know it is pure god the godly wisdom is pure which means it is holy it is clean um it has honesty in it so when we're operating in godly wisdom that's what will be evident that it's clean it's heavenly and uh, it's it's bringing about holiness and righteousness there will be the trait of peace in godly wisdom when we uh, walk with godly wisdom a sense of calm a sense of peace prevails because we are walking by the Spirit of God and gentleness, right? Gentleness. What is gentleness? Gentleness is an expression of kindness or, or politeness, um, courtesy, compassion. So there'll be an element of gentleness. Willing to yield. That simply means that an attitude of uh, teachability where one so-called you know, wise person is open to learning, is open to corrections, if at all they come uh, their way, and they are teachable, they are teachable, then willing to, uh, yeah, full of mercy, which means expression of compassion and tenderness, good fruits, good fruits is what, good fruits is, uh, we have uh, positive outcomes, we have uh, outcomes that are glorifying God, we have outcomes that are edifying of the people. So that is good fruits, uh, no partiality. Okay, So that means godly wisdom will uh, have equity for all, fairness for all. It's not like, okay, I'm applying this rule to you, you follow it, and I'm not going to follow it. That's not fair. No, that's not equity. So the same standards are applicable and uh, or fair standards are applicable and equity and fairness among all people and no hypocrisy. Hypo no hypocrisy means it's not two-faced. Uh, what, whatever it is, it is, right? It's genuine. It's genuine. And uh, uh, of course, it will speak the truth in love. And uh, this is what you know, God wants us to carry. And when we walk in this kind of wisdom, we will um, uh, demonstrate that that mature life. Uh, we will we will bring honor and glory to God. So the reason why James must have enlisted all these things is to develop the early congregation in the right 
uh, lifestyle okay maybe they they had all these issues there was selfishness fighting people would have been calling themselves mature and not having any control on their um, speech and james had to address these matters to them and finally you know he talks about uh, um peace right so those who make peace uh, the peacemakers they sow seeds peacefully that will bring them the fruits of right living so with that you know we close off um chapter 3 here and uh, in the next class we will move on to uh, chapter 4 and hopefully tomorrow we will finish the book of james uh, two chapters will you know go through them uh, one after the other and we should be done with james this week and um, yeah, yeah we'll move on to the uh, other remaining books of the bible in the upcoming classes so let me just uh, uh, open out this time for any questions so if there are any questions let's discuss then we can pray and close all right so seems like there are no uh, questions or you know comments so uh, let us please pray and we wrap up today's class Uh, could one of us on the call please pray let's pray father god we come to you under the name of jesus we thank you for this day thank you for the class that we had we thank you for the power that is in our tongue jesus and god i pray that jesus everything that we learn today we will carefully apply it in our life and be uh, a salt and light the city around us be a light that shines in this dark world lord be with us remind us your words lord when we uh, fail to remember it holy spirit you help us pick us up when we fall and we love you jesus and uh, help us to walk according to your words we thank you for pastor nancy and i thank you for everyone over here in jesus name i pray amen 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 thank you everyone thank you for connecting god bless you have a great week ahead uh, i'll see you tomorrow we have a class tomorrow so we'll catch up in the next session bye for now